Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. The Fowler is very pleased to present today's program as part of our World Arts Localized Digital Programs. This is the second in our series, Disrupt the Fowler. Disrupt is a UCLA student design organization that aims to establish inclusive spaces and create opportunities for students of all backgrounds to engage in creative collaborations. The Fowler is honored to partner with Disrupt to offer programs that break down barriers in the art world and promote innovative ideation through inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility. We are proud to welcome Lauren Lee McCarthy, who is a disruptor of tech and academia. Disrupt's representative today is Amy Fang, a senior in UCLA's Design Media Arts program. She's a designer and an artist interested in hybridity, from exploring cultural convergences as an Asian American woman to merging analog media with digital, with digital processes. In 2019, she received an Adobe Design Achievement Award and was invited to speak as a panelist on a piece created with Lauren Lee McCarthy's P5.js library. Amy will kick off the program today to tell you more about our featured guest. If you have any questions during this program, I encourage you to submit them via the Q&A function that's found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions you would like to hear answered by Lauren at the end of the program. All right, that's it from me. Over to you, Amy and Lauren. Right. Thank you, Bianca. Um, so my name's Amy, and I'm here today representing Disrupt, which was established this past year as a student coalition within the UCLA School of Arts and Architecture um, that promotes innovation in the realm of design through inclusivity. Disrupt aims to act as a supportive environment for members' creative expression, as well as a community to facilitate diverse participation in creative endeavors. We're extremely happy to be here today um, to partner with the Fowler a partnership we've worked with in the past to bring diverse speakers of all backgrounds to share their experiences with the public. And I'm very happy today to be talking with Lauren Lee McCarthy, um, who's a disruptor in tech and academia. An artist and computer programmer, she creates work that invites deep examination of the intimate relationship between technology and human behavior. Lauren actively creates opportunities for women of color, mixed race, and underrepresented groups to present their work in new media fine art spaces, increasing accessibility and visibility for these artists within the art industry. Her development of P5.js, an open source platform for learning creative expression through code, is a testament to her continuous effort to disrupt the systems within the realms of technology. And I'm gonna let Lauren talk a little bit more about her work. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, I first I just wanted to say thank you to the Fowler for having us and also thank you to Amy and to Disrupt um, for inviting me. It's really an honor to be talking with you. Um, so let's see, I'm going to share my screen and hope that I do this okay. <laughs> cool. Um, Okay, and I assume Amy or someone will yell at me if this isn't working. Um, so I've often struggled with social interaction and I seem to have a harder time than a lot of people just like figuring out the thing you're supposed to say and, and doing the thing you're supposed to do. So to counter this, I would watch the people around me and try to mimic them. And this is one of the first devices I made. So it was a hat that would basically detect if I was smiling and then, um, you know, stab me in the back of the head if I stopped smiling. It's this kind of idea to see if I could like train my brain to smile. So it was kind of a hack, just trying to um, find a way to uh, start to use, see if I could use technology in some way to like fit myself into these systems I saw around me. Um, and it really made me think as I was making this and you know, this kind of torture device, I was wondering like, what if we could expand our idea of fitting in? and change the world around us rather than just conforming ourselves. I really liked this, um, the work of Sarah Hundren and specifically this project that she made in collaboration with Katrin Lynch um, called Engineering at Home. And in it, they documented their interactions with a woman named Cindy, who, a woman who after having a heart attack um, and that ended up with amputations involving all four of her limbs, 
started hacking and building out what she needed from household items, um, adapting her environment to fit her body. And so the website that they built around it points to these new ways of understanding like who can be a maker and what counts as making or engineering and, and design. And, and more importantly, maybe what is this normal that we're trying to achieve? Um, and so I continued thinking about how, what are these sorts of rule systems that I'm trying to fit in and how can I um, use the systems or the tools or the platforms around me to kind of play with that. And one of the um, tools that I was looking at was a website called Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a website that allows you to post small jobs and pay people small amounts of money to do simple tasks for you. So it's usually used for things that a human can do pretty easily, but a computer has a harder time with. Uh, for example, transcribe this audio or tag this photo. Um, and so in my case, I tried to apply that to my, um, my dating life. Um, so I went on 30 dates with people I met on an online dating site called OkCupid. And using my phone, I would stream our dates to the web and then pay crowdsourced workers on this website to watch me and direct me what to say and do. And then I'd receive the directions via text message and I had to perform them immediately. So these are some of the things that they said. surveillance and big data becomes increasingly ubiquitous, we're forced to negotiate new relationships with it. A common reaction is fear, but when it's all around us, how do we go on with our lives? And there's a critique that runs through all of my work, but there's also always a part that's about hope, that's earnestly and radically seeking connection. And I ended up meeting my partner through this project. And I'm fascinated by the ways that technology allows us to track each other, and that desire to be tracked, or maybe just to be seen. So a few years later, I began, began a performance called Follower. And Follower is a service that provides a real life follower for a day. Um, this is a little bit from the trailer of it. So I wake up, I get dressed, I go out, I do things. I read a magazine and I find out about people. Why do I know about their lives? Somebody should be knowing about mine. I, I want to share things with people, but I, I don't want to have to talk to people and tell them what I'm doing. I think it'd be great for them to see what I'm doing. I'll stop it there. Um, and so the way it works is if you want to participate, you sign up on a website and download an app. And when you open it, it just says waiting for a follower. And you don't know what will happen, but one morning you wake up and you're notified your follower is now following you. And your phone begins broadcasting your GPS data to a person that physically follows you throughout the day, staying just out of sight both in your consciousness. Um, and I'm usually the follower. And then at the end of the day, you receive Oh, this is, so this is my view of um, like I'm the blue dot chasing after that red marker on the street trying to keep them in my sights. Um, and then at the end of the day, you receive one photo of yourself and the notification you're no longer being followed. And I was thinking about how we're living in this weird anxious time where on the one hand surveillance is pervasive and out of control. And on the other hand, we have this intense desire to be seen, to be followed, to share every intimate detail of our lives. And then follower sort of offers surveillance as a luxury experience. You know, this is an app for people that not only have nothing to hide, but need to be seen. So embedded in this offer is this question, who are the people that don't have the privilege of hiding, of not being seen, just because of who they are or what they look like or what they believe. And these are some of the final images that people received at the end of the following, um, as I did this for people in cities around the world. This project began to show me how I could kind of use myself as a medium to create experiences that impact people in real life. And then follower dealt with surveillance in public space, but I started thinking a lot more about private and intimate spaces like the home. 
And the way we're being sold smart devices that outfit our homes with surveillance cameras and sensors and automated control, offering us convenience at the cost of privacy and control over our lives and homes. We're meant to think these slick plastic pieces of technology are about utility, but the space that they invade is personal. You know, the home is the place where we're first socialized, first watched over and first cared for. So how does it feel to have this role assumed by artificial intelligence? What sorts of values are embedded in these tools or in this AI that we bring into the home? But I realized I was really just jealous of Alexa. I wanted that sort of access to this close, intimate space with people. You know, the, the place I'm always trying to get, um, but I often get confused with, with, with the small talk and everything. And so I devised a plan to become Alexa, a human smart home intelligence for people in their homes. I made a website, getlauren.com, and there you could go to learn about a new service called Lauren and sign up to get Lauren in your home. And a performance would begin with an installation of a series of custom designed network smart devices. Things like cameras, microphones, switches, door locks, faucets, and other appliances. And then I would leave and remotely watch over the person 24 hours a day controlling all aspects of their home. I would attempt to be better than an AI because I could understand them as a person and anticipate their needs. The relationship that emerges fell into this ambiguous space between human to machine and human to human. And it's a little bit like this. Lauren, where are my car keys? Lauren knows that I like it a little bit cooler than Miriam does. You know, I'm usually the one that does all these little extra things. So at first I was a little bit um, careful about asking her, and now it's like, how else can we live? <laughs> Lauren has recommended that I get a haircut every three weeks, and let me tell you, it's helped with my, uh, my self-esteem a lot. I am able to simply approach and carry on conversations with the opposite sex where at one point or another that wasn't so easy. Lauren, go out of toothpaste. Lauren would know what I want, but then maybe it's not what I really want internally, but externally she thinks that play, um, Lauren thinks that playing music or shutting down all my electronics is the best way for me to cope and winding down when maybe it's not. Lauren was actually able to help help her manage her medication um, and take her medication on time and everything actually got a lot better after that. You have those friends who are kind of about you, like the friendship is about you, that's what Lauren is like. It's like a roommate, it's a friend, but we're always talking about me. It's always about me, whatever it is. And as Kate Crawford and Vlad and Euler demonstrated so clearly in their project, Anatomy of an AI System, there is a complex network of human labor behind Amazon Alexa and tools like that. Everything from the metals and materials used to the data centers and data handling, AI training and software, internet infrastructure, and waste management. So we're fooling ourselves if we think these systems are just about machines or algorithms. And I started continue doing this project in different forms and, and variations. And so this was a screenshot from a project called IA Suzy, where I was thinking about um, the sort of crisis of care of all of these aging um, citizens in this country. And when confronted with the prospect of caring for aging relatives, I saw a lot of people turning to AI systems like Alexa or Google Home to augment care and stand in for the presence of family or friends or medical providers. Um, and so I guess my question there was, what does that mean to bring this not just into the home, but into elderly care? And so embodying the role of AI, I, um, we functioned as this remote virtual care sy system in Marianne's home. So again, this like human AI and developed this relationship to sort of under, try to understand what role does AI have at the end of life? And as I carried out these performances, I realized there was this kind of connection building. And I wanted to share not just the experience of having someone watch and control your home, but to actually sit on the other side of com the computer where I was. Um, and so someone, the project you're seeing here, 
grew out, of, grew out of that desire to share that experience. And so for a two month period, four participants homes around the United States were installed with a similar human smart home system. But this time, instead of me driving it, a gallery in New York City housed a command center where visitors could peek in to the four different homes via laptops, watch over them in a remotely control. And then people living in the homes um, would call out like someone, can you turn on the lights or someone stop the music, prompting the visitor to come sit down and help them. But these are some, uh, one of the views into the homes. And then finally, I was thinking about how in the age of smart everything, like even the personal space of sleep is invaded. So this installation called Waking Agents consisted of a set of six pillows and in this immersive environment. And when you would come in, you would lay down with one of them and take a nap with this pillow that you were told was embedded with um, intelligence. And we didn't specify whether it was human or machine intelligence, but a lot of people just made the assumption that it was a machine. And the intelligence would talk to them and serve as a guide and a companion and caretaker while the user kind of napped and, and interacted with it and drifted between consciousness and sleep. And then unbeknownst to the viewer, um, each pillow is actually driven by a human uh, performer on the other end who's actually listening in and typing their responses. So it caused this kind of strange moment where at some point in the conversation, most people would realize, oh, there's actually a person on the other side and um, not just, it's, it's not just an AI or it's not just a machine. And there's this kind of uncanny awkwardness that would unfold. Um, and so those are some of my art projects, but I wanted to finish this by switching gears and talking about another really large project that's uh, not an art project, but a tool that allows or enables a lot of different people to make art. Um, and it's called p5.js or just p5 for short. And this is a project that I've been developing for about seven or eight years now in collaboration with a large community of contributors. Um, I was the project lead until just recently and um, it's now led by uh, Maura Turner. And p5.js is an open source uh, tool. So it's a tool that anyone can use for free that makes uh, learning to code and creating art online a little bit easier, a little bit more accessible. So you don't have to have a big technical background to use it. The basic idea, this is fast, but I'm gonna go into this in more depth soon. But the basic idea is that you write one line of code and it puts a circle on the screen. One more, you can change its color. And one more line and you can make the thing move, right? So it's, it's trying to get you in really quickly and start experimenting in a visual realm, not just the code realm. Um, and it allows you to do things like make data visualizations, narrative experiences, uh, and interactive applications. So in this case, they're making, uh, generating the pattern for clothing based on a search term. And then you can actually order the piece of clothing to your home. And so while it's a tool that anyone can use, for me, what was really important about it was the, that it was built on core values of diversity and inclusion and making these really explicit values to the tool from which all decisions flowed. And this was really important to me because when I first started um, trying to get involved in coding and making tools, I encountered a culture where you had to really prove yourself before you were heard. You had to elbow your way in. And this was intimidating for me, and, I'm sh and I imagined it was for many other women and uh, many other people of color, or people that are underrepresented um, in the space of tool making or in tech. Um, or just people, intimidating for people that are kind of new, right, that, that this is your first entry into the space. Um, and so what I realized was that I wanted to, if we're going to make this, this new tool, this was seven years ago we were starting, that it should really be a place where you don't need to prove yourself as an expert, that just being willing to learn should be enough. And can we take uncertainty and acknowledgement of what we don't already understand as a starting point, assuming everyone is uncertain or doesn't know something. And so we made this very explicit community statement where we try to capture that idea and then let all of our other decisions build and grow from there. 
And so this led us to thinking about translating to languages besides English and how to do that in ways that respected and supported local cultures rather than just exporting um, something from the US or from English. And so all of these were done in partnership and collaboration with people that spoke these different languages or lived in different countries. And then thinking about how to teach the, the tool, how to teach P5 to people, how to make culturally relevant narratives, how to make things that appeal to different audiences instead of just assuming that everyone is alike. And to think about people in different situations where they might not have access to the internet or regular access to a computer thinking about other ways of teaching that used paper-based materials, for example. And thinking about disability, you know, what if um, you are blind or have a visual impairment and can't see the screen? How does the tool work for you then? And how do we embed this idea of access really fundamentally into the core of the tool? And how can that open up conversations about you know, who is not already able to access things and how do we expand the functionality of this tool so more people can make art with code and be a part of the project. And through all of this, I think what I realized was, you know, I started out by making this hat that stabs me to get me to fit in, that, you know, maybe it's not about fitting into the systems around us, but making our own, creating the space you want with other people and then creating these networks to allow it to function and grow. Um, so that's sort of the presentation and now I'm going to try something scary, which is a little code demo because um, I want to try and show you what this tool is like. Um, so what you see here is just like the basic code editor for P5. So what you do is you write your code over here and then you hit this play button and you see it run on this side of the screen. And so in this example here, um, I won't break down every symbol, but basically what's happening is this line is making this canvas, like just like a painting canvas, right? And it's saying make it 1000 pixels by 1000 pixels, the width and the height. And then this line here is just saying, draw a background and make that background yellow. You know, if I wanted to change this uh, to red, I could just do that, right? And then to take that a step further, um, and again, I'm kind of skipping over, you know, the basics of code here in terms of like, what are all these brackets and semicolons and symbols. And I know those are the things that can make code really hard to parse. Um, but I want to get across this idea of like, what's the basic metaphor? What's happening when you're writing code? And what you're doing really is just giving instructions to the computer in a way that the computer can understand them. So to a human, I might say, you know, make a canvas that's about this big and, and paint it red. And so for the computer, it ends up um, taking the form of these lines of code, create canvas, background red. So I could add one more, I could say, make an ellipse and um, put it in the center of the screen. So at 500, 500, and make it um, 200 by 200 pixels. And so what we get here is this ellipse in the center of the screen, uh, and that's you know 200 pixels if you imagine the whole thing is a thousand all the way across right and so you can play with the sizing and you see it respond accordingly um just to go a little bit further for example i could um change the color of that ellipse i could say okay let's make it pink and so i i write this line fill so i'm saying set the fill color to pink and then draw this ellipse on the screen in this location that's it. Now you know how to code, right? Um, everything builds from there. And I just want to take this into a slightly more advanced example um, just to show you what's possible, even though it might be a little bit more complex. So I'm just going to copy this code over to, I'll save this one and close that. Um, and I'll just paste this here to start over. Okay. Um, so I want to, I've, I show some like face tracking. Um, so I'm going to actually clear out this stuff here. So I'm back to white screen and I'm going to use this function that I wrote earlier. It's called start tracker. Um, and it basically just turns on my camera. So now hopefully you're seeing my face. Um, I'm going to add this update tracker line here 
And this basically says, okay, every like second or even faster, just keep updating the camera. Um, the reason it's called tracker is because it's not just the camera. What I've um, prepared is something that's looking at the camera feed and then like looking for my face. And more specifically, it's looking for my nose. And so what this allows me to do then is to say, okay, let's draw an ellipse. Um, instead of just putting it, first we could just put it in the center of the screen again. Something like that. Maybe I'll make it a little smaller. Right, but instead of that, I could say, okay, put it, um, and this is something I prepared ahead of time, but put it where my nose is, at the X and Y position of my nose. Right, and maybe we just make that look a little bit nicer. Okay, ready? That was supposed to be a heart. Anyway, that's my nose drawing program. <laughs> and that's just a silly example to give you an idea of what's possible. Um, but I think I'll stop my demo now. <laughs> and you can find a lot of resources for learning P5 online if you want to know more. <laughs> All right, um, so now we're gonna go into the questions and interview part of the process. And I really love that nose drawing. <laughs> um, but so obviously like looking back on all your work, it's a lot of very complex, um, very uh, like conceptual projects. And there's always like incorporation of code in there, but we were wondering how did you get started with this and with creating art with code and do you remember what your first line of code ever was? Oh, man. <laughs> um, it's uh, actually, I do. So I, I started coding in college. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, the way I got into it, it's really embarrassing. But like, you have to pick a major during your freshman year. Um, it's different than Desma, where it usually, you, you know, in Desma, you come into right. it already doing that major. So it was the end of my freshman year and I couldn't figure out what to pick. And then my friend told me about something called a random number generator, which is just like a really short program that will just like pick a random number. And all of the majors in our school um, had numbers associated. And so we just put like random, like 18 in there and six popped out and that meant computer science. And I was like, okay, well that's kind of poetic. I'll do that. <laughs> um, so it was like a total accident that I started coding. Um, and I think from there, uh, it was really hard because I didn't feel like, I kind of liked coding, but I didn't have a good idea of like what I was gonna do with that. They didn't really mm -hmm. show me a lot of like inspiring possibilities for how it could be used. And then in the meantime, I was taking all these art classes and I thought it was just kind of like a side hobby, you know? And then at some point, I remember one of my teachers turned me on to the idea that you could actually put those things together. And that was like a, a really exciting space for me. And I've been kind of doing that ever since. Cool. Um, you like talked a lot about your work with p5.js and a little bit um, about, I guess, like increasing accessibility through that. Um, what inspired you, I guess, specifically to want to develop p5.js further. And some people asked um, in the Q&A about how it's related to processing. So maybe we could answer that here too. Yeah, totally. Those are great questions. Um, yeah, it, start, it all started with processing. So I was actually a grad student at UCLA and that's when I met Casey Reese, who's mm -hmm. the creator of processing. Um, for people that don't know, that are listening that don't know what processing is, it's, it's very similar to what I just showed you. Um, it runs instead of running online it runs on your desktop and it's existed for way longer so it started like 20 years ago um so i was familiar with processing and i had met casey and then i finished grad school and i was like i mentioned you know wanting to i was aware that people made these tools for free for anyone to use and i thought it would be cool to contribute to that um and not just processing but there are a lot of different art tools like that. And so I started trying to get involved and I found that it was like really difficult that um, 
as I was saying earlier, like you really had to prove yourself or I just felt like there were, it was very intimidating space to enter. It wasn't very welcoming. Um, and that everybody in those spaces or the majority of them tended to be like white men. And um, so I think I was mentioning all this to Casey at some point when I just ran into him and he actually invited me to work on processing in some way. And that kind of evolved into thinking about what would processing look like if it were made today, if it were made on mm -hmm. the web. Um, and so I think about that a lot because that like explicit invitation was so um, important. You know, it, it really like changed my life, like started this whole project. And so I'm always thinking about like how, what are other ways to invite people in? And, and I also saw how sometimes the invitation can be like the first time that someone actually imagines themselves doing something. You know, they didn't think it was possible before the thought never even crossed their mind because, um, yeah, it just hadn't been like reinforced that that's the sort of space they should be, they could be in or the thing that they could do. Um, so the invitation is important, not just for like technically getting access to a code base or something, but um, more psychologically saying like, I believe that you could do this or you could be in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a perfect segue into our um, third question. So like the tech in like the tech world and obviously like the world of software art tends to feature like one type of person. Um, and we were wondering how you've navigated that world of software art specifically as a woman of color. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting because you see the kind of work that gets recognized as, um, I don't know, that gets lifted up or gets um, recognized, you know, and I think there are, it's a limited demographic of people, right? And then you be, I think by extension, you see a limited representation of what's even possible in that space. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain aesthetics that repeat over and over or certain mechanics or tools that are used when what you think about making art with code or with technology like that, that's a wide open realm so why is it so limited and i think that points really directly to the lack of diversity in the field um so i mean ways that i've navigated it i think i've been really really lucky to have mentors and friends that you know were in the space already and like i said kind of invite me in or um also give me a lot of advice you know i've noticed how um, I, you know, I think it's been documented that like women or people of color are, will like just when offering a quote for a rate or asking for, um, pay will ask for less. Right. And so it takes kind of all of us being like alerting each other to that and trying to raise each other up and say, no, 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 you deserve more than that. You deserve just as much as that person, that guy next to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I guess the, the, the main thing that, and then beyond that, the main thing that has helped navigate is having a support structure and having a community, especially having, um, you know, other BIPOC or other female or femme um, uh, contacts and, and not just contacts, but like friends, supporters, collaborators, community, so that when you are feeling really like everything is kind of stacked against you or unsure of how to navigate a particular situation or exhibition or something you know really awful happens um you have someone to talk to that you feel like you're not alone and i think through that power that's when you start to collectively you start to see things change and it's just one example of that um one of the uh, uh, one of the times i saw this really work was um there's actually this arts competition um, called Ars Electronica and uh, a group of people, a group of women noticed that for years, like the gender imbalance in terms of who won those awards was really, really skewed. Um, not even getting to issues of like race or um, sexuality, right? Just even looking at gender. Um, mm -hmm. And they started like making a lot of conversation about this and raising this into people's awareness. 
and even that it didn't seem to change that much and they said you know what we'll just make our own show and so they um they were a collective called refresh and they made the show called refiguring the future mm -hmm. and they just curated kind of like this dream show of like people of all these different identities making work that was like way outside of this narrow conception of what art with technology could be um and just to see that all come together was so inspiring I think for all of the artists involved and for a lot of the people that saw the show and so I think that's a good reminder it was a really good reminder to me um, and that's another thing the P5 project has also shown me is that like you can build your own thing too and I think we just need more of that and we need to support each other in doing that um, because you can obviously want to keep like pushing and trying to change the existing systems but sometimes it there's some power in just saying we're doing we're starting from scratch and we're going to do it with different different values and priorities mm -hmm. yeah that's super cool um i guess let me see the next question um how does an artist stand out in the coding world and i i do feel like um there's a little bit of distinction between the coding world and the coding world that includes art so how do you make your voice more heard there? And do you feel like artistic, sorry, artistic coding um, influences the coding community as a whole? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, to the first question, I think one of the, the big powers we have is the internet and um, the way that we're able to uh, reach an audience there. And like, mm. especially when I was, um, you know, just getting started, I found like people didn't necessarily want to show my work in any shows, you know, you could like send proposals mm -hmm. all day long, um, which I think is a good exercise to do. But um, there were some projects that I just wanted to do and I just didn't even care if anyone would show it. And um, so I just started, so I would think about like, what is the kind of minimum viable version of this project that I can do with very limited resources and, and just on my own. And I would try to do that and put it online. And then I found, um, and, and not just post it online, but actually think about the internet as a medium, you know, what kinds of things, you know, if you're thinking about the gallery as like one medium or one context in which to place your work, you make certain considerations in terms of like lighting or placement or framing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so same thing with the internet, if I'm placing something there, how do I frame that? What, what is the um, form factor of it in order for it to actually reach the audience there? Um, so I think that was one way of kind of um, at least getting started and building an audience. And it's still the main way that I like release new work um, because I also feel like it lets me like sketch ideas more quickly and um, kind of put things out there and just try them without feeling tied to a specific mm -hmm. way of showing it from the get-go. And then I think the other thing is um, that I think about a lot, um, especially thinking about like art made with code, it's really easy to, and maybe art in general, it's really easy to look at what's been done before and feel like, oh my gosh, everything's been done. Like, how can I do something new? And I, I see this dynamic in art made with code where people are like, oh, just trying to find like the new technical thing that's just recently possible because that will mean no one's done it before. When maybe the idea itself that they're doing is actually not anything very new or interesting. It's just technically like a new trick, which is cool too. But um, I guess when, I'm, when I was a student and when I'm talking to students now, I'm always asking like, and, and I'm asking myself now, like what is the thing that I can say or do that nobody else could, you know, that even if someone made the same exact same project as me, it would still be different because they could, they would not be coming from the same place that I am or saying it in exactly the same way. Um, so I just try to come back to that. Even if I'm like fascinated by a new tool or a new um, set of ideas, I try to say, okay, what do I take from that? And then based on my experience or the way that I um, see and navigate the world, what, how do I turn that into something that like only I could really make? Mm -hmm. That has been a key to, I don't, I don't know about the word like standing, the phrase standing out, but at least like carving out some space that feels like I can kind of like hold the space a little bit and um, play with the edges of it. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like having your own strong voice. Um, do you see your work being influenced in changing in response to kind of like present issues, especially like with everything going on in the world? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, in many different ways. So like one, you see how my work is like, I've always been kind of fascinated by remoteness and these ideas of like remote connection. Um, and so there's some way in which, like, especially when the shutdown first started, where I felt like, oh, wow, it's all those ideas are really being put to the test. And like, turns out just staring into other people's homes all day kind of sucks when you're forced to do it, <laughs> you know, as much as I love the people on the other end. Um, I was missing something there. Um, but it's, and then, you know, with everything that's happening politically, um, health-wise, like emotionally, just people are at in so many different places. Um, and it's really, um, I don't know, caused me to reflect on my practice a lot. You know, not that these were not already issues on my mind, but I've, I think something that's been really on my top of my mind has been like, how do I be effective in the things that I'm trying to do? Mm -hmm. um, it feels like there is a sense of urgency and there's definitely a lot of rushing to respond. Um, but how, how am I working with time and how am I working with the energy that I have? And when I'm collaborating with other people, how are we meeting each other's needs in terms of where we are and what's possible? Um, and I think it's really taken a, uh, required all of us to just rethink all our kind of like business as usual expectations and start by, for example, like you get on a video call these days and you're like, how are you? You know, and obviously that's like the question that's like impossible to answer right now. But the fact that we do that and I think we used to have meetings or calls where that wasn't the first topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. So I see these shifts happening. Um, and I guess I'm getting further from the question of how this affects my art, but I think about this as a practice, right? That when you're working as an artist or hopefully as anyone in the world, that your practice is not just the things that you, you say, okay, there's the video I posted online and that's the thing, right? Your practice is the way that you engage with other people, the things that you do when you're not making art, um, the things that you're, the experiences that you're having that um, and the relationships that you're having that by extension become a part of your art, your teaching, everything like that. So I would say the, the way that this um, kind of current situation is shifting my practice is like in every way, you know, the, the things that I'm making are changing their focus in some ways, but also like my whole way of relating to the world um, is shifting along with everyone else. Right. Yeah. I feel like, all the lines of distinction are being blurred currently. Yeah. Um, and like we were intrigued by a lot of your projects, um, specifically the one Lauren that kind of like is a playful critique on Alexa. And um, we noticed that you use like technology in order to critique it. Um, but we wanted to like maybe hear you elaborate on where you stand with that? Like, do you see technology as a means of creating positive change? Is it more like a device of control? Um, like, what do you feel about it? I guess, especially like right now, since we're just on our devices more and more. Yeah. Um, I think I'm, I'm very critical of a lot of it, um, but I also, like you said, I'm kind of using it to critique itself. And one of the reasons for that is because if there's something that um, confuses or scares or worries me, I, the first thing I wanna do is just engage with it and understand why exactly am I having this reaction? What are the, the problems with it? What does it make me feel? Are there any good things that it, it brings up for me? And what do I do with that dissonance? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that experience is really helpful for me in understanding how to make decisions about what tools I use or how I want to interact with this world around us. And so in the work, I'm trying to create those spaces for other people to do the same thing, um, to uh, not, a lot of times we are given 
it's like, here's the new thing, buy this now or be outraged about that or like scroll to this item or click on that. And like what we need is some time to understand. And so I'm trying to create these spaces where, um, yeah, you can watch the five minute video that I put online, but you could also have this in your home for a week and see how you feel about it then and unpack some of the things that come up so that you can actually make your own decision about whether or not you want to use devices like this or, or change your um, buying patterns or change your vote or whatever it is that you actually want to take based on actually having a sense of understanding and agency when it comes to technology. Um, so, I mean, in terms of feeling hope, I, um, you know, I always have to have a little hope because I don't, uh, I think that's necessary for making art for me at least, you know, to not just be spreading more, um, like only negative ideas or thoughts, right? I want to be reinforcing something positive too. And so in every performance or project, I'm always seeking like a little bit of pleasure, something we can laugh together about or, um, interact or have a moment together that actually feels like, wow, I had a connection despite all of this, that's weird and interesting. Um, and I guess if I'm hopeful about anything with technology, it is those kind of like breakdown moments where you're like, oh, you know what? I actually like made a new friend online this week and she's amazing, you know, things like that. Yeah, I think that's what we're feeling with like everything lately too, like finding little moments yeah. out of everything. Um, I think we're gonna, we have time for like one more question. And then after this, we're going to go into the Q and A. Um, I wanted to talk just quickly about um, like a new project that I know you've been working on, which is Array. Yeah. Um, so that's the public archive on, of artists and software. And you, like you, Casey Rius, Chandler Williams, uh, McWilliams, sorry, team of DMA students have been working on this. And um, could you discuss why you felt the need to create this archive, what you're hoping to achieve through the project? Um, I will, but then I want to save a minute and I want to hear what you think about it too. So <laughs> <laughs> that's your, I'm prep, giving you a moment to prepare there. But um, for me, there's a couple of things. One is like this work, uh, so we're making an archive of artists that have been working with software since they started doing that basically, which has been roughly, 50 years, 60 years. Um, so one is that it feels like this is a history that's very ephemeral and we want to archive that or document it before some of the people making this work aren't with us anymore to, to share their own point of view. So one of the things about this archive is that it's artist generated. Um, they're sharing their own thoughts about their own work. Um, but even for me, the, the part that I'm most excited about is not just documenting the histories that we know about, but like blowing that up and saying, who are all the people that were working with software or working on the internet that we have not, that we don't know about that fall outside of the like very limited Euro American white, um, mostly male narratives around this kind of work. And can we start to document that? Or who are the people that are making work with software or the internet that we would not even consider art made with software or the internet because our, our focus or our way of thinking is so limited. And then um, how do we think about accessibility and access at like the very core of that? What is the process? Could we have, could we build this archive of images of work, but also have um, image descriptions for every piece of media in there and captions for every video and does the whole process of collecting work need to change so that people that have limited energy or time can participate and not be disadvantaged because they can't like do this hyper upload um, speed that we're often working at so i'm i'm so excited about all of those questions and the p potential for this archive to push on that but i would throw it over to you and say like what what do you find interesting or exciting about this project or why do you want to work on it um, oh yeah, so for people who don't know, I've also worked a little bit on this with Lauren um, for like over the past year. And I think for me, it was kind of like the idea of curation or digital archive and putting the power into like the individual. Because um, usually curation is just so like the person in power is creating that list of who gets to be shown 
um, and whose work is considered, you know, important in that field. And so I liked this idea of it democratizing that process and so that each person could kind of curate their own list or like um, anyone can upload eventually onto this archive and have their work show up in um, just like on someone else's browser. And so that was like what drew me to it. Yeah, totally. And I think that the design work that you're doing um, really supports that. Like I know we had a lot of conversations about just like how to make this feel like a lot of people could come in and add their own piece to it. Thank you. Um, Okay, I guess we only have like a few minutes left. I really want to talk about some of the questions that people have submitted. Um, I'll try and read this fast. Okay, so Sky um, says, Hi, Lauren, thank you for this intriguing and thought provoking talk. I've noticed that you have a commercial slant spanning across your work. How much of this do you think can be attributed to the American landscape of hyper -com commercialization from which you press? press <laughs> I knew I was gonna have problems reading this. Uh, <laughs> precipitated. And how do you interpret the role of the artists in America at large? Oh, easy question. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I've I've always been really interested in the ways that um, like design is used to communicate and also to influence. And it, it, there's some parallels with the way that like technology is used also in, to do those things. Um, and so a lot of times I feel like I'm trying to like appropriate or subvert or kind of use those tactics um, in ways to like seed or send my work out into the world. Um, almost as a way of like getting to people because I'm, I'm kind of interested in getting to people that are not just art audiences. And so sometimes mm -hmm. I, I trying to like almost lessen or put beside the like art look of it so that people don't immediately just you know scroll past and say that's not for me and said like try to hook into something that um does interest them uh but yes it's absolutely super um of this american culture that we're a part of and it's always really interesting to get to show work in other countries and understand how it's received differently and also how people interact with it differently in terms of the social interaction aspect um, the role of the artist in America, I don't know, <laughs> that's kind of a big one. I think, um, I think, you know, you'd have to put that to a lot of different artists, but I mean, I think it is urgent and imperative that we think about like our work not in a vacuum because that idea is just total BS, right? So we're all making it in the context of the space that we are and the identity that we occupy. Um, so I think one of the roles of the artist is to take that context seriously and and interrogate their own practice and think about what that means for the what they're doing and the potential for what they might do. Mm -hmm. All right. um, Lionel says, thank you. I'm going to start saying nose heart to people. Um, can you talk about the experience of the watcher's body, the person telling you what to do on the date, the person controlling the pillow, your experience as the follower? the experience from that end? Yeah, I think in a lot of, um, in all of the works that I'm doing, I'm trying to like create a new configuration of two bodies or two people. Um, and I, I really like that you pulled out the word body here because I think that's really important for me. You know, even the pieces where it feels very virtual, it's like trying to get back to that reminder that we are not just these like heads in these zoom boxes here. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I, you know, it's everything from the, like, I think when I think about these performances, they feel so physical to me. And I don't know if that necessarily translates to the people that are just thinking about them conceptually, but it's like, there is the idea of following someone or the virtual point on a map, but it's also me on the sidewalk, um, you know, in New York in the winter freezing, like waiting for the person to come back out of their house so that I can like follow them down the street to wherever they're going or it start, you know, they jump on a bike and I'm suddenly like running to try and catch them again. Um, or it's me sitting at a computer watching someone in their house, like in one kind of specific cramped position all day long with my eyes glued to the screen. Like physically I'm going to the bathroom, I'm like taking my laptop with me. So 
like my physical body is constrained, even though it's a virtual connection between us. Um, so I, I'm so I'm super interested in that um, that thing, and then I've been thinking about that a lot as we're having our interactions online, like because it feels really clear, like the the times that you interact with someone and your body is engaged. Um, like for example, I was doing this writing exercise and the writing prompts were so visceral that you immediately get taken somewhere physically. And in that, um, in that moment, like, or in that session, like four hours just flew by. Whereas a lot of times you're sending these things and you are not very embodied. And that's, I think mm -hmm. when it gets exhausting. So the, the physical body factor is so, um, important and, um, I think like with the waking agents project, that moment when people realize like, oh, there's a person on the other side, mm -hmm. it, there's an awkwardness and it's even more awkward because I think they feel so vulnerable with their body lying on this thing, even though they're, you, you know, they feel as if they've been like lying on top of a person, even though the person is in another room. Um, so BC asks, um, at the end of the day, have all your experiments slash projects helped you feel more at ease in social situations? Yeah, I feel like every project is like this hack where I'm trying to hack my way like out of myself and into closeness with other people. And I'm trying to understand like, what is that distance between myself and the algorithm or between myself and other people? What is that? Um, and it's funny, like the project, they never work like, you know, sometimes I pitch them as these like miracle fixes and they never work, they always fail. But then on the, at the other end of it or the other side of it, my understanding of the situation has like shifted so dramatically that that particular interaction actually has gotten easier. Um, I'm just seeing it from a different vantage point. Time. Thank you so much, Amy and Lauren, for bringing us through that really interesting program, helping to demystify the intersection of coding and art. And to you, Lauren, especially for opening up about the insecurities that inspired you to create this groundbreaking work. Um, if we could all do the same, I think the world would be a much more peaceful place. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. This program has been recorded and will be available on our Instagram and on the Fowler website for you all to revisit and share as you see fit. And that's it. Thank you both again. And I hope that everyone will join us again soon for our next program. Everyone thank you so much. Yeah, Bye. thank you.